He's slipping down the bench because I'm thinking, what have you got yourself into here? Anyway, she said she was seeing a figure in her mind. This is March 1990. And it, it was asking her to communicate information to me. And basically it was this, that I was going to go out eventually on a world stage and reveal great secrets. There was a, quote, spiritual without the religious connotation, a spiritual transformation coming that was going to awaken humanity from its slumber, from its hypnotic trance and the world was going to change dramatically. In, in the passage of time, massively for the better. But there, was, there were great secrets that had to be revealed and understandings that had to be revealed so that that process uh, would take place. So I'm, I'm <laughs> introducing sport programs for the BBC. I'm a national spokesman for the Green Party and this lady is telling me all this stuff. Whoa, excuse me. One other thing that was said at that time is that I would write five books in three years on these subjects and I'm thinking, five books in three years? I don't know anything about these subjects. Well, it happened to the month. And there was one line which said, uh, one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that can change the world. And that's very important because the, the, this is not about me. This is about information. And I want to emphasize right at the start that I'm not tr uh, coming anywhere here uh, to try to persuade anyone to accept what I say. I'm not interested. This world is drowning in people standing up and saying, I've got all the answers, you must believe me, and if you don't, you're wrong. And I am completely at peace with how people receive my information for one simple reason. It's none of my business. It's none of my business what anyone makes of my, their, my information. It's their business. It's my business what I put out. How people receive it is completely up to them. They accept some of it, accept this bit or that bit or whatever, fine. That's their right. So I've not come here to persuade or sell a belief system. After uh, I went to that psychic lady and she told me that stuff, my life suddenly started to change dramatically. Um, and what the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung called synchronicity started to be so blatant in my life, like a, a stream of constant coincidences that were leading me to information and people and experiences that were pushing me in a certain direction. And I ended up in Peru, where the biggest transformation of my life took place in 1991, very early February. This is a place called Siyustani. It's an Inca ruin on the top of the hill there. And just out of shot over the, on the far hill is a standing stone circle. And I, it's a long story. I've got so much to say today. I'll, I'll keep this brief. But I ended up in that stone circle by a series of coincidences. And something happened to me there over a period of an hour. Um, which completely changed everything. First of all, when I went into the center of the circle, I felt like um, a drill going in the top of my head and a flow of energy coming through me to the ground and another one coming back. My arms then went out like that at 45 degrees without any decision by me to do it. And my feet were anchored to the ground like two magnets. And in this state, thinking, what the heck is going on? There was two, two, two very clear, I don't know, statements, thought forms, whatever. First one was, uh, they'll be talking about this a hundred years from now. What? And the second one was, it will be over when you feel the rain. I'm standing under a piercing Peruvian sun, not a cloud in the sky. It will be over when you feel the rain. I'm going crazy. But over this period, with this energy getting... Uh, greater and greater. In the end, my body was shaking with it. Um, I noticed that over the distant mountains, there was a light gray mist. And the light gray mist got a, became a dark gray mist. And over a period of about 45 minutes, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes, this rainstorm came out of the mountains. And 
it was coming towards me like a wall of water, what we call stair rod rain. And I'm watching it coming towards me. And by the time it got close, my, I, I'm like plugged into a nuclear power station. I mean, my body can hardly stand. And then the rain hit me. And when the rain hit me, all this energy just went, stopped. And I'm, my arms are, my shoulders are agony. Didn't feel anything while it was going on. And I came back to England after that. And something like this happened. And information, concepts, insights were coming into my mind at such a fantastic rate that it was like pressing too many keys on a computer too fast. The computer freezes and goes, I can't process this. I'm freezing. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And so for about three months, I was in a state. This is me in that period. I was in a state where if you'd have asked me what planet I was on, I would have had to check. But, and I, I, at this time, being a television presenter, I went on national television to be interviewed about this thing that was happening to me uh, on primetime talk shows and stuff. And I became uh, probably the greatest figure of ridicule in much of British history, certainly in modern times. I couldn't walk down any street without being laughed at. I couldn't go into a bar that was just uproar. A comedian only had to say my name on the television to get a laugh. He didn't need a joke. And, and then, um, after three months of, of where am I, it was like the computer unfroze. And people were coming up to me, old friends, and they were going, I thought you'd gone mad. I read you'd gone mad. You're the same man I, I used to know. What are they talking about? Well, I appeared to be the same person, again, that they knew, but I wasn't because I was seeing the world in a totally different way. And I started asking the big questions that go unasked throughout people's lives often. Who are we? Where are we? Why is the world as it is? And when I went to that psychic and she had that communication. This is what um, one part of it said. Sometimes he will say things and wonder where they came from. They will be our words. Knowledge will be put into his mind and at other times he will be led to knowledge. We have a, an advertisement in Britain um, for um, kind of stuff you, you paint fences with. And the, 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 the sales line is, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Well, all I can say is over the last 20 years, this has done exactly what it said on the tin. Because over these 20 years, it's like some force unseen has been passing pieces in the puzzle to me. In the, in the kind of order that you can most easily understand and, and, and assimilate. And it has taken me through this journey of extraordinary revelation. Another thing that was said at that time uh, it, through the psychic, arduous seeking is not necessary. The path is already mapped out. You only have to follow the clues. That was 20 years ago, and that's exactly um, what has happened. And as these pieces kept coming to me in meeting people, coming across documents, finding books with certain passages in them that related to this and that, most synchronistic way, I started connecting the dots between apparently unconnected events, people, subjects, history. Because the control system, the global control system, wants us to focus on a dot. This is what it does in science with its specializations. You focus on one dot. And if you focus on a dot without peripheral vision, then you don't see how the dots connect. So you, you're in completely in the dark of the bigger picture. You only see one dot within it. The idea is to get people to focus on something so that the peripheral vision um, is not there. 
And as we as humans are passing through this maze we call life, trying to understand it, trying to survive another day or another week, another year, we have endless diversions. That's this keep right, even though he's going left. Um, and, and you see these, uh, you know, signs that says good luck. <laughs> um, and it's all over society are these diversions to keep us in a bewildered state. What's going on? What's life about? Why are they doing that? What the, what, uh, uh, uh. And when, when you connect the dots, because individually, what is it? But when you connect the dots, um, it starts to take on a clear, clear picture of what's happening in the world and why the world is as it is. And you realize there's an elephant in the living room, an elephant in the room that is just there being ignored. And that elephant is that there is a multi-leveled conspiracy to maintain humanity in a state of slavery. Mental, emotional, and even physical slavery. Now, we see what we see as slavery, and we think, well, it's obvious that it's slavery. The greatest form of slavery is for the slaves not to realize they're slaves because they never rebel about being slaves when they think they aren't. It's all a mind game, as I'll come to. So in the early years after this experience in 1990, the synchronicity of information showed me that in this world that we experience all the time, that there is a network of interbreeding families who are manipulating global society unseen and are seeking to impose what we call a global Orwellian state after George Orwell's famous book 1984 about the big brother state which includes microchipping people um, controlling us through vaccines and drugs, the, the, obviously the, the police state that's appearing all the time. The early years were all about that, and they continue to be so. All these different things are ongoing, but from about the mid-90s, something else came into my life, and that is that these families um, are actually um, connected to non-human entities that have been manipulating this planet for thousands and thousands of years unseen. The next phase, the most important to understand it all, was from 2003, where the synchronicity started to give me um, uh, endless information about the illusory nature of physical reality. How we think we're in a physical world, but it isn't, not least, it can't be because of what it's made of. And that's what I'm going to concentrate on in the first uh, section of the uh, presentation today, because everything after that, all the conspiracy stuff, whether it's non-human or whether it's what we're experiencing all the time, cannot be understood without understanding the nature of reality. And then, if people think that's fantastic, <laughs> well, in the last, like, six months uh, or so, a bit more than that, it's nine months maybe, the synchronicity has turned again, and has started to point to the fact very strongly that the moon is not what it appears to be. Now, all of these things I'm going to go through today because um, it turns out we are actually literally lunatics, um, as I'll come to. So we're at, the, we're at this uh, fork in the road. And if we keep going the way we are, not least through the European Union in the Czech Republic, we are going to be, um, we're going to be living in Orwell's 1984. In many ways, we already are. If we are, however, go down the other road, which I'm going to talk about as we go through the day, then we can find freedom in a way that we wouldn't even believe possible. Because we don't know, even know what freedom is. And the choice is between that way in which we become microchip clones or that way in which we open to the true infinite genius that we all are called 
consciousness. This is what the control system wants. Wants people in this state, unthinking clones who all perceive the world the same. Barcoded, microchipped people. Just clones of the system, like a computer terminal. But this is what humanity has the potential to be, and this is humanity's true state. Freedom. 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 And over the last 20 years, I have seen what I was told was coming unfolding. 20 years ago, in that period, I was told that there was a vibrational change coming, was already starting, and this vibrational change, which I dubbed the truth vibrations, was going to do two things. It was going to wake people up from their coma. The people who were less asleep were going to awaken first, and so on. And something else, it was going to bring from the hidden into pu the public eye all that's been hidden from us up to this point. Now, 20 years ago, there was no evidence of that whatsoever. Now, it's fantastic. The number of people are going, Whew, why didn't I see it before? And then look at it. All the information that's coming to light, vast tracts of which I'm going to present today, to give us a fix on the world and ourselves that we never even were thought about 20 years ago. It's happening. It's happening and people are waking up more and more. Not the majority yet, nowhere near, but more and more every day. And if we're going to wake up, if we're going to break out of these straight jackets of thinking and perception, we need to realize there's not one way. The system wants us to believe there's one way because it wants uniformity. Look at any tyranny, any dictatorship, and they want to impose uniformity. Look at communism. Look at fascism. There, there is another way. In fact, there's not only another way, there are infinite other ways. You don't have to all be the same. We can choose not to be. We can express our uniqueness instead of following the herd. We don't have to be uh, faceless people in a faceless crowd. We can express our uniqueness. We don't have to do what everyone does. We don't. And you know, when we choose not to follow the herd, it can be very, very beneficial sometimes. In fact, often. You don't have to swim with everyone else. You can swim the other way. Just this man, John Mason, said, you were born an original don't die a copy. But how many people do? And the more they go through life and the more they take on the programming, the more they become a copy. You see children expressing their uniqueness. And as what we call life unfolds, you see that uniqueness being suppressed and deleted. The multitude is always wrong. It's an old proverb and is absolutely true. History shows it again and again and again. Giordano Bruno, truth does not change because it is or is not believed by the majority of the people. Or as Mahatma Gandhi said, even if you are in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. No matter if the majority believe otherwise. Giordano Bruno was um, burned to death in uh, 1600 for having the audacity to say that there were other inhabited worlds, that the universe was infinite, and that the earth was not the center of the universe. This is the stadium on which the entire control of human humanity, whether it's in a country or globally, is played. The human mind. When there's a few trying to control the many, you cannot do it physically. You can do it physically in a small area with tanks and soldiers and stuff, but you can't do it globally. You have to get people to think the way you want them to think and therefore behave and perceive the way you want them to see your control system as not the slavery it is. So the, the freedom, the real freedom, comes from freeing our minds.
from the programming of a lifetime. Freeing our minds from the idea that the education system is there to inform people and truly educate them when the, the education system is there to program perception so the children become the adults that the control system can handle. Free our minds from the diversions of um, so-called entertainment that is designed to make us look over there while we're being further enslaved over here. Free our minds from the idea that the mainstream media, I've worked in it, the mainstream media is there to tell us what's going on in the world. It's there to give us a version of events which suits the control system. Free our minds from the fake messiahs who come along claiming change when they're just another mask on the same face that controlled the guy before. Anyone see the difference between Bush and, and, and Obama? Free our minds from the fake terrorist events that are there to create problems to which the control system can offer solutions, which is more control, more centralization of power. Free our minds from the fake uh, terrorists, people like Osama bin Laden, who was on the payroll of the CIA, and then he's wheeled out to be the villain so that they can justify the invasion of Afghanistan. They can, they can read your number plate from satellite, but they can't find him. Free our minds from the nonsense of human-caused global warming, which is just another scam to further tax us and to further justify more and more control over our lives. It's happening all over the world. And the science of global warming is a nonsense. I'll come to that. Free our minds from the idea that the pharmaceutical cartel is interested in human health. It's interested in human sickness because that's where the money comes from. And on a greater level, it's interested in de uh, destabilizing the human vehicle chemically and in many other ways. Free our minds crucially from the four-letter word that controls the world, fear. All the time, the, the system's trying to put us in fear because people in fear give their power away to someone they think will protect them from what they've been manipulated to fear. And crucially, again, to free our minds from the idea that we are little me, just a, an individual with no power, just a pawn in a game which they cannot have any influence over. The, this is the, the fork in the road. Consciousness or clones. Awakening or staying asleep. And I don't know, I, I'm not come to the Czech Republic to tell people who've lived here all their lives about the Czech Republic. I wouldn't insult uh, you by doing that because I've only been here a few days. But I can say this as I go through the day. If it hasn't happened in the Czech Republic yet, then it's, it's, it's planned to be. Some countries are ahead, Britain, America, in this control system, but it's designed to be global. We're having uh, cameras everywhere to see us in what, almost anywhere we are in the built environment. This is a wonderful one in, in, um, in London, this. This says, George Orwell lived here. In America, we have this excruciatingly painful sound technology now to scatter peaceful protests. When I started talking 15 years ago about the microchipping agenda, people being microchipped, uh, people laughed. It's happening. We have the chemtrails, not contrails, chemtrails. Um, all over the world this is happening, where planes are pouring out these crisscross um, lines of whatever's in there. There's metals in there, there's, there's chemicals in there, and it's happening all over the world. I was, I was in South Africa a few weeks ago, why out from the cities in, in the Kalahari region, chemtrails. And then there's the stuff they're putting in our food and drink, 
designed to destabilize us mentally, emotionally, and physically. And no one is more targeted than children. It's funny that, um, not funny ha-ha, but funny, you know what I mean, um, that when you look at the symptoms of children who are affected by food additives in their food, drinks, sweets, and all the rest of it, which is a lack of attention, hyperactivity, etc. And then you look at the symptoms of this new disease they've come up with, with children, called attention deficit disorder. And when you, they, they, they um, say you've got attention deficit order, they want to give the children drugs like Ritalin. But the symptoms of attention deficit disorder are exactly to the letter the symptoms that you get from food additives that, we, that children eat. And then we live in a world where it seems to be okay to pepper bomb cities full of civilians and children in the name of freedom, in the name of giving people freedom. And all these things are going on, and that says, it all looks fine to me. And it's interesting when, um, when you look at this, it says here, to have your head in the sand, you have to be on your knees. And so many people still are in this state, in complete denial of what's actually happening ignoring the chains and saying, isn't it great to be free? Isn't it great to be free? I can vote for someone every four or five years and then they go away and do what they like until I get the chance to vote again. And a lot of the denial of what's happening is what I call wishful thinking. We really wish it wasn't like this. And I do. I wish I wasn't doing what I'm doing now because I wish I didn't, it wasn't necessary. But here's, here's a great example of wishful thinking. This says, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. Right? Now that's wishful thinking that that threat would make any difference to their husbands going down the bar. You know, when I saw this picture, I immediately uh, ordered a large one. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Wishful thinking is, is something that um, gets us nowhere. I wish things were different. So do I. But they're not, and we have to face them. It is what it is. Once we can look something in the eye and say, I accept what it is, it is what it is, then we're in a position to do something about it. Not when we're got our heads in the clouds thinking, if I look the other way, maybe it's not happening. The Orwellian state is coming in all over the world. The police state is coming in all over the world. And it's been coming in for years and years and years while the population has been watching game shows focused on these famous entertainers or watching the sports. Not, there's not a problem with any of that. But if that's all we do, then while we're looking at that, the pieces in the game are being moved around the board. And that's what's been happening for years and years and years and years, decades and decades. The future is here. This is no longer some projection as it was 20 years ago. This is now on the daily news, what I was talking about then. And we need to go from this to this pretty damn quick. Because the number of people who are manipulating seven billion is a tiny fraction. It's not something, it's not a situation we face that is impossible. It's, it, we've just got to focus on it and do what's necessary, which I'll get to as we go along. Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And that's where we are, a time of challenge and controversy. So where do we stand? But like I say, while this is going on, something wonderful is happening. There is this awakening. So as the control system tries to um, impose itself more and more, more and more people are in, an, in, in, 
in society are starting to see it. They're starting to awaken, not just to what's happening in the world, but the true nature of who they are. It's a, a, an incredibly uh, exciting time in so many ways. And if we're going to go through this awakening, if we're going to expand on this awakening, we need to ask big questions and therefore we can get big answers. And I'm going to concentrate now for the first part of this presentation on the nature of reality, which is vital to understanding everything that follows. The big questions, who are we? Where are we? What is reality? And this is science personified. This is mainstream science. It's mainstream education and it's the mainstream media. Uh, for reasons I'll come to, they literally cannot compute reality outside a tiny, tiny band of possibility. And thus, they'll never, ever understand the nature of reality until they do so. What you find when you look at this with an open mind on information rather than preconceived idea you find that this, illusion, this um, physical world is actually not physical at all. It's, a, it's an illusion, a physical illusion. Not only that, it doesn't exist out there as it appears to, it only exists in here for reasons I'm going to come to. Great American comedian, but a very aware man called Bill Hicks, um, died in the 1990s. He described reality magnificently when he said this all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively there's no such thing as death life is only a dream and we are the imagination of ourselves and that the, the bottom line of the entire control system is manipulating humanity's imagination of itself an imagination that says, I have no power, I'm just little me. We think that we see with our eyes what is out here. But there's nothing out there that is physical. What we see, or when we see, we see with our brain. In fact, our whole genetic structure which decodes information which the five senses pass to the brain and constructs what we call reality these pictures I'm going to go through now they are painted or in whatever way they did them on a flat surface but they were done in such a way as to trick the brain into seeing them as you might call three-dimensional that is on a flat surface so is that and that and that, and that. The illusion is th the way the brain is tricked. Now, is this a woman's face or is it a butterfly and a flower? It depends how our brain chooses to uh, read that reality. Again, just tricking the brain to see three dimensions. Now, is this a man? Or is this a Mexican, a woman, a dog, and a bush? Depends how the brain chooses to read reality. People say what you see is what you get. <laughs> I don't think so. As Einstein said, Albert Einstein, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. And then comes the question, why is it persistent? Why is the illusion persistent? And by the way, if we're creating our, our reality or constructing our reality, how come I'll see the same car going down the road as someone else will? It's because we live in a virtual reality universe. It's the equivalent, obviously a much more staggeringly uh, sophisticated version of the wireless internet. I'll explain that in a second. We're now seeing virtual reality games getting more and more quote real. And 
This, for instance, that's the man's real face, and this is his virtual face. And there are suggestions that within not too many decades, uh, they will have reached a point where you'll hardly be able to see the difference between the virtual world and this, this virtual world. We're having training uh, simulations now in virtual reality. People are learning to fly to a large extent in virtual reality. And what some hospitals are doing, as in this case, is they're playing virtual reality pictures down um, into the man's uh, eyes, i.e. brain, um, when they're changing dressings in, in burns units. Because the, the pictures they send, which are to do with cold and all the rest of it, affect the way, the pain, being felt by the dressings being changed. Um, now, when you look at how these sophisticated virtual reality games work, what are they doing? They're using the human five senses. These gloves are sending sensations to the, to the hands, the five senses, touch, the, eye, the uh, goggles are doing it for the eyes, etc. And what they're doing is basically hacking in to the body's natural decoding systems and putting other messages into the brain to uh, get the brain to decode reality to see the game in the way that they want to, to see it. So on one level, this reality is digital. And, and the, these um, virtual reality games are all about tricking the five senses because the body I'll expand on all this the body is what I call a body computer it's not a computer in the sense of the desktop it's a biological computer and what I mean by that instead of just reacting to to the way it's programmed uh, to react it has the ability to think and assess that's what the human immune system is doing all the time while we're standing or sitting here, our immune systems are making decisions. And that's what the body does. By the way, this, this, this picture was taken of this man. Um, exactly at the moment, he was told that Barack Obama had won the Nobel Peace Prize. You know what I mean? <laughs> what a joke that was, eh? <laughs> now... Um, the base foundation of this reality is not what we see, it is waveform, vibration. What I'm going to call as we go through the metaphysical universe, whenever I mention that phrase, I mean the, the vibrational level of this reality. And that's where the information is that we decode into this apparently physical world and as even mainstream science will confirm waveform patterns can hold staggering amounts of information so this is the metaphysical universe the um, vibrational level and through the body computer we take it through f the five senses into the electrical the digital and finally as I'll explain as we go along the holographic, i.e. the apparently physical. But this is the base. If you want to change this, you've got to change this. Because that's just like trying to change a, a movie by um, shouting at the movie screen. <laughs> by the time it hits the screen, it's a done deal. This is where it needs changing. That will become very, very important later on. So the five senses are decoding mechanisms that take vibrational information into electrical information and send it to the brain to decode. This is why this scene in the Matrix movie was so, so accurate. When Neo said about the virtual reality he found himself in, this isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Exactly. Now, here's the key. If we are constructing reality by how we decode information, then if you want to get the population to decode reality the way that suits your control system, then you've got to program that which is doing the decoding. That's why I say it's all a mind game. 
These are, all these pictures like this are by a great artist friend of mine called uh, Neil Haig, all symbolic of course, but that's what we're doing. We're decoding this vibrational information, I'll explain where that comes from in a second, and that's where this world exists. I grant you, I'm standing here, it looks like it's out there, it isn't, it's in here. And you manipulate the control, the, 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 the um, decoding system, the brain, the body, and you control the world. So, this universe is waveform until it goes through the brain and then becomes what we call the physical world. So the five senses are decoding uh, mechanisms. Now the most obvious one in terms of turning vibration into something else is hearing. Because when I speak now, there is no words passing through this room. There is a vibration passing through this room, that coming from the, the vibration of the voice box. When it reaches other people, they take that vibration, turn it into electrical signals which go to the brain, and then the brain hears sound. It's decoding sound. But all the five senses are like that. This, uh, this was a, a news story only a, about two weeks ago. Researchers have been able to translate brain signals into speech using sensors attached to the surface of the brain for the first time. The breakthrough, which is up to 90% accurate, offers a way to communicate for paralyzed patients who cannot speak and could eventually lead to being able to read anyone's thoughts. Researchers have been able to translate brain signals, electrical signals, into speech. That's what we're doing all the time. Same with taste. The, this is where the, the, the vibration is picked up, goes to the brain to be decoded into taste. Same with uh, smell, same with uh, touch. All these different parts of the brain are decoding the five senses. This is where the game is played. And that's why I said earlier that the stadium on which the control system uh, is played out is here. Right there. This is why we have to take control of it back. And we can. We can. Even movement's an illusion. There are certain brain uh, malfunctions which um, have people, when, when someone's pouring a cup of tea, instead of seeing, the, seeing it moving, it's, it's a still arc. They just see a still arc. And the same uh, malfunction has people who see a car in the distance, then the next time they're aware of it, it's here, Shoom, going past. It's because the brain is not decoding reality in a sequence anymore. And, and I'll explain how that goes on as we move along as well. So basically, basically this, is, this is what this world is in, the, in a, a really symbolic form. It's a computer game uh, in a way. And the human race has been hypnotized to read reality in a certain way. For instance, I've, I, I went to a few hypnotist shows when I was researching one of my books. I wanted to see these people at work. And I saw people um, being given a potato, having been told, programmed to believe it's an apple. And they're sitting there eating this potato thinking it's an apple. Why? Because the vibration of the potato was passed from the taste buds to the brain but the brain thinks it's an apple, so that's the vibration it decodes. And we are hypnotized. We're becoming unhypnotized more and more, but we are hypnotized. And here are the hypnotists. The media constantly telling us a version of events that is largely nonsense. From the earliest possible age, they're getting children in front of people telling them about the world themselves, reality, what's possible, what's impossible. These are hypnotists, doctors who are giving you the version of, of, of the human body and, and human life that the drug company controlled um, medical training schools are giving them. And then the Obama is another one. Then there's the, you know, the newspapers and these people like O'Reilly in America is just a propagandist. They're, they're all hypnotists. And funny enough, I had, I had an experience. Um, I spoke in London about uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago. And um, 
I was sitting in my hotel room working on the thing because you know this, this, this a lot, a lot of work on me because it's, it's, it's very long, and um, so my head's going boom, boom, boom. So I thought I'll go down, I get something to eat, and clear my mind, right? So I go into the restaurant, and it's it's at a window looking out on this where all these people are walking past, and it was a very synchronistic experience. It, it, the coincidences were amazing because. Every time this lady came across to me and said, would you like another glass of white wine? I said, yes, right? So it was synchronistic like that for quite a time. And I looked out the window. I looked out the window and um, suddenly it must have been a convention of twins going past, right? Because first of all, I saw this guy in this yellow T-shirt and there was a man just like him about one step back and then this guy came down on, on, on a bike but it was a tandem it was like two bikes and the two people on it looked exactly the same and this went on for some time so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking this is interesting so I, I said I said to my higher self I said higher self it said yeah I said why am I seeing reality like this and it came back immediately in a flash it said because you're bloody drunk you know what I mean <laughs> and, and <laughs> And you know what it's like, it, that felt right to me, that felt right to me. Um, and the, the point I'm making is, I've had a few glasses of white wine, and now I'm reading reality in a completely different way. Why? Because it's affecting the way brain, the brain's reading reality. It's, it's, and if the brain does that, you, you see a different world. So what we, what we live in is what I call the wireless cosmos, the wireless um, universe, just like the wireless internet. Exactly the same principle. This is the great thing now. The shaman and people of the past, who've, um, or what we call the past, that's an illusion as well, but I'll come around to that. Um, but the shaman of, of what we call the past, um, they had to describe reality in ways that was accessible by the people at that time. So they use symbolism, and the, the anthropologists come along and say, oh, these were primitive people, look what they said. No, it was symbolism, mate, symbolism. Um, but today, we now have this wonderful opportunity because technology is mirroring the very reality that we're experiencing, and nothing more than the, the, the wireless internet. When you say to people, tell me about the internet, they say, well, it's pictures on a screen, and it's graphics, and it's colors, and it's, it's moving. Yeah, it is. But the only place the internet exists in that form is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's electronic circuits and all the other stuff. And then you say to people, tell me about television. And they say, well, it's moving pictures on a screen. Yes, it is. But the only place that television exists in that form is on the screen. Either it's broadcast transmissions or it's the old digital thing they've got now. Most of what we call television is not that at all. That's just the finished part of it. Oh, this is our screen. The wireless internet. If, um, if this hotel theater has um, the wireless internet, surely it does, then where is it? Where is it? But if I tune this computer, to the internet, no wires necessary, no connections necessary, as with this, um, this example here, in the middle of a town, then I pull a whole collective global reality out of the unseen onto a screen. And if I'm in South Africa or America or the Czech Republic or France, I'll pick up the same collective reality. And because we are decoding the waveform information construct of this reality anywhere we go, that's why we see the same car that other people see. The difference is, what do we think of that car? What's our opinion of it? What's our feeling about it? That will be different. That's where we put the unique spin on it, but we still see the same car. In the same way, different people will go to a website and they'll see the same website. But what they think of it, and what they make of it, and whether they stay there or go away from it, is, is their own uh, choice. So the body computer, look, look, he got the Nobel Peace Prize, all right? Get used to it, okay? Relax. Um, <laughs> the body computer is decoding out of the unseen this vibrational information construct that we call the universe. 
This is why this is so accurate in the Matrix movie. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. There's another angle on that when we get later on as well, in the second section. So what is the universe? It is information. That's what it is, it's information, and we're decoding that information. And not only that, it's an interactive game, so we are putting information into the construct by our actions and our beliefs and our thoughts as, uh, in the same way that you, you get information from the internet, but you also post on the internet. It's an exchange of information. And it's information decoding information. It depends how it's encoded to operate. So a computer disk is information and it's read by a computer which is information one is encoded to be information to be read and one is information decoded to read that information it's all information and so this is what we're doing we're taking this information construct and turning it into an apparently out there world the basis like I say is vibrational fields and that's what even the body is it's a vibrational field it's um, energy, vibrating energy. When it passes through the decoding system, it becomes apparently solid, but cannot be, um, as we'll see. As a result of this illusion, we think the world is outside of us, because that's the way we decode reality, but actually it's inside of us. It's inside our head, inside our genetic structure. Now, I came across this information, because I've got so much to say, I, I, I've, I've just produced a book of... Uh, 355,000 words explaining this stuff um, in much greater detail, but I can, I can give you the themes. They have um, discovered, uh, German scientists, I think, that there is a gigantic black hole in the center of our universe, uh, galaxy. And the idea is now that there, are, there is a giant black hole in the center of every galaxy. And, and, and this absolutely fits the information I've come across and put together, uh, which is this. The black holes generate the base vibration of this galaxy to collectively this universe. As this vibration um, resonates, it triggers the suns, in this case our sun, to release information in the form of photons, photon energy. It's the black hole is the vibration. The vibration triggers the suns to release information in the form of photons. Photons are the basic unit of light and all other forms of electromagnetic radiation. This is the wireless internet of the cosmos. And this is the information that we decode. The Earth grid of meridian lines, some people call them ley lines, with all their power centers which the ancients were used to put their temples on and their um, places of worship. What is going through these meridian lines of the planet is photon energy. And the planet is decoding this information in the same way that uh, we do. The human grid of ley lines, which um, of course the whole basis of the Chinese uh, healing art of acupuncture is based, what's going through these meridian lines of the body, what the Chinese call qi, is photon energy, information. And the genetic structure, not least the brain, is decoding this information, like I say, into an apparently physical world. Now, there have been scientists over the years who've said that this world only exists as it appears to be here, physical, when it's being observed. And that is absolutely true for this reason. When you're playing a computer disc, 
in a computer, every part, all the information on that disk does not appear at the, on the screen at the same time. Only that which the computer is reading at that time. All the other information remains on the disk. And so when we are observing, uh, uh, putting our attention on something, we are decoding it into this reality. But when we're not doing that, it's in its base form of vibrational information. The brain is, has no light in it. It's dark, black dark. And yet, light, 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 lights. I'm seeing lights from a, a brain that cannot be penetrated by light. Why? Because it's a decoding mechanism, not literal. So when in the Matrix movie there was that scene where the child said, there is no spoon, it's not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself, exactly right, because of the way we read reality. There are people who can walk through fire without getting burned. People say that's impossible. No, it's not. Because the fire is an illusion as much as the feet are an illusion in terms of physicality. If you believe that if you walk through fire, you will burn your feet, that belief system is the way the brain will decode reality. You'll burn your feet, no question. If, however, as these people do, you go into another level of consciousness that overrides that programming, then you can walk over hot coals and not burn your feet because the brain will decode that reality instead of the one where you go, ouch, get an ambulance. This is, the, this is the greatest con trick of all in the control of humanity. We are consciousness. We are awareness, disembodied awareness. That part of us that people experience in near-death experiences when they leave the body and they can still see and they can still perceive and they see other realities. This is the vehicle that allows us to experience this, 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 this world, this, this reality, this frequency range. And the, the idea of the control system is get us to believe we are this and not this. Because there are massive implications for control. A Central American shaman, who I'll quote in the second uh, section quite a bit because he, he said some brilliant stuff. He said this, we are perceivers, we are awareness, we are not objects, we have no solidity. We are boundless. We, or rather our reason, forget this. And thus we entrap the totality of ourselves in a vicious circle from which we rarely emerge in our lifetime. And the reason we rarely emerge is the control system is constantly trying to get us to um, see ourselves in, in, in physical terms. So the body allows consciousness to experience this reality, but it's, we are multi-leveled, multi-dimensional. If, if consciousness in its disembodied state wants to interact with this reality, then it must have an outer shell that is resonating within the frequency range of this reality. Otherwise, I couldn't hold that up. You just fall to the ground. It's like two radio stations on different frequencies. They don't meet. So consciousness takes on these shells, these body computers, to allow us to experience this world. And the trick is, for the control system is to get us self, to self-identify with the body, the vehicle. Now, it's interesting when we, we say we're going on the internet, but we don't, do we? The computer goes on the internet. We observe the internet through the computer. It's exactly what consciousness does in relation to the body, because I'm going to just emphasize a difference here, which is going to be a theme going all the way through. The difference between mind which is that um, which directly works through the body, mind, body mind as I'll call it, and consciousness which observes through the body mind. The idea of the control system is to constantly hold us in body mind perception, that one, instead of allowing us to expand to consciousness and see the bigger picture of everything. Now the difference between the two is, uh, is, is uh, profound. A couple of three years ago now, um, I was sitting in the bath 
uh, of why I have a, a bath, I suppose, but I was sitting in the bath, and I had this vision, it sounds grand, these pictures in my mind. And it started off with billowing energy, which I immediately took to be consciousness. And then an eye appeared in that energy. The next thing was a um, telescope appeared, and at the other end of the telescope was this reality, this universe. And the last thing that happened was the telescope morphed into a human body. This is Neil Haig's uh, depiction of how it all ended up. And that's so profound because this is expanded consciousness, what we really are. But when we're working through the human body, it's focusing uh, our attention, therefore our experience, on this reality. And we're not accessing this in anything like its entirety because it, we're, we're looking at life through this lens and that's fine as long as we know this is a lens and we don't forget that that's who we really are because if we think we are the lens and there's none of that then the control system's got us piece of cake no problem so what we call death is putting your telescope down in effect it's it's withdrawing your attention from the vehicle back into disembodied consciousness awareness that we are and people are terrified of death so many people because they're frightened of the unknown that's why one reason why they want to keep all this information from us because the more we're frightened of death and frightened of the unknown the easier are we, we are to control on mass now everything is the same awareness one infinite consciousness but this infinite consciousness takes different forms and what I'm calling consciousness in our disembodied state is like an ocean a free flowing ocean, infinite ocean and what we call mind that what connects us down through into this reality is like frozen water if you like very very much more limited in its ability to perceive and understand this man Ramana Maharshi um, left home when he was just a young boy and went to a mountain in India called Arunachala something like that and um, he meditated basically for the rest of his life um, and this is what he said he came out with some very very interesting things mind is consciousness which is put on limitations you are originally unlimited and perfect later you take on limitations and become the mind humanity has become the mind and has been manipulated to do so from cradle to grave Einstein said a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe a part limited in time and space he experiences himself his thoughts and feeling as something separated from the rest a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness and uh, this all this has put humanity into a state of false identity where it identifies self and therefore potential with the body, the vehicle, instead of with its true self, which is infinite awareness. That says, I am not David Icke, because I'm not. David Icke is not who I am, it is my experience. It is a name for my current experience, that's all. I am consciousness. I am infinite awareness just like everyone in this room is and everyone in this world is our core state is one of all possibility that's the core state of all uh, existence and I, I you know people who've gone into real deep meditative states I, I, I don't meditate but I go into these states spontaneously sometimes you go to a place where there is no vibration there's no movement and there's no sound it's just still silence and I've only taken psychoactive drugs once in my life that was in 2003 in a rainforest in Brazil which I did specifically because I wanted to I wanted to experience it and for five hours in this state of ayahuasca experience this rainforest plant I um, had this voice as loud as mine is now Fem took a female form, that's the way I decoded it anyway. Uh, talked to me about the, n the illusory nature of reality for about five hours. It was fascinating and hilarious. 
And I came back to uh, England and went through checking out what this voice had told me uh, in mainstream science. And what's extraordinary is mainstream science has already realized this is illusory. But it's, it's not connected the dots, because that's not what it's supposed to do. And so everyone's got a bit, and no one's putting it all together. So you can see, actually, it's blatant. This is an illusion, a physical illusion. So this is a state of all possibility. And what that voice said to me at one point, which turned out to be very profound, it said, if it vibrates, it's illusion. And I later realized what that meant. In this silent, still state, is all potential, all possibility, all that is and ever can be. It's everywhere and nowhere. People say, well, you can't be everywhere and nowhere. You can in all possibility. And everything and nothing. You can't be everything and nothing. You can within all possibility. And it's, um, it's interesting. We talk about the nothing, the no-thing. When the no-thing, the nothing, is everything, because it's all potential waiting to manifest. Because if I said, um, if I stopped talking, and then I said, what can you hear? Most people would go, nothing. But what you can hear is everything, all potential waiting to manifest. So you've got the silence, everything. And then I start talking, and I pulled one possibility out of all possibility. And when I stop talking, it's gone back into all possibility again. All potential. And we, we, so many people are afraid of the silence. They go into a room, they put the television on, they get into a car, put the radio on. Because silence takes you into places that some people don't want to go. It's fair enough, it's only a choice. But in the silence, you are hearing... I mean, how, how, how many people kind of go into meditative states there's no there's no there's no noise there's no vibration if they go deep enough and they go I've got it now and they have some kind of insight well no one's spoken to them no they've entered the realm of all possibility where you can access any knowledge you want within the no thing and then what happens in what we call creation is vibration is generated which manifests through the decoded world of sound, and worlds are created through information encoded in this vibrational form. This is something called cymatics. If you've never seen it, it begins with C. It's C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S. If you go into YouTube and put cymatics in, it's amazing. What they do is they put these particles on a metal plate, just, just, a, just, a, like, a, just a mess, you'd think. And then they play sound across the plate. And these particles move into amazing geometrical patterns like this. And then they change the note and they rearrange themselves. And then they, change, they stop the music and it all goes back to apparently random. So in the random state, it's all possibility, symbolically. Because those particles are just sitting there waiting to go anywhere you want. And then the sound is played and that creates one possibility. And it's what we call a world. So out of all possibility come all these worlds of vibration, frequencies we would call them, which, which interpenetrate and um, uh, exist in the same what we call space, just as all the radio and television stations broadcasting to Prague are, are in the same space that we're occupying now. As long as they're not close to each other on the dial, they don't interfere with each other. So we are in a frequency range. That's what this world is. It's a frequency range. We, th we look out of our, our eyes, or think we do, and we, we think we're seeing everything there is to see. There is, we know we're seeing a frequency range, and other levels of reality, or the type, uh, frequencies of reality, are sharing the same space. And even according to mainstream science, the... Energy and mass and matter that exist in this universe, in what they call dark energy, dark matter, etc., is massive compared with the tiny, tiny frequency range that we see of this universe. For instance, the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.005% of what they say exists in this universe. They can hardly uh, 
portray it in that line compared with what exists and visible light which is the only frequency range that we can decode to see is a fraction of the 0.005 percent humans are basically blind all these things that we, we see and, and beyond that's what we see and we think that we can see everything when we look through our eyes we can't so what we are living in is a frequency range that's what this world is and if you can change your frequency which people or entities that understand the mechanism of this far more than we're allowed to do in our suppressed state of awareness you can enter this frequency range and you can leave it by changing your frequency and to the observer whether it's a UFO or whether it's some kind of non-human entity or whatever to the observer it, they say it just appeared out of nowhere and then it disappeared and people go he's been drinking what's he on what's he taking and all that's happened is it's entered the frequency range that we can decode and then it's left to the observer it's appeared out of nowhere and it's disappeared into nowhere it hasn't it's just left the frequency range you can decode the whole thing is about focus of attention wherever our attention is focused that becomes our reality and this body computer this lens this telescope focuses our attention upon this reality that's why it appears to be the only one now if you can come into this frequency range this world and you can hold a conscious connection to your true self then you're in this world experiencing it but you're not of this world in terms of the point you're observing it from then you've got everything you need but if um, you don't, if you don't hold that connection to consciousness and the control system is all about making sure that doesn't happen, then you go through life in this bewildered state, wondering what the hell it's all about and trying to survive another week. Then we come to time and space. One of the things that makes people think that the world is out there is what we call space and what gives us the impression of movement from past to present to future is time but there is no space and there is no time there's only information we decode to have the illusion of that when you put a, a disk in a computer what is it it's a disk it's just information and yet the computer decodes it so that in the computer game you appear to have space distance perspective and you appear to have time the movement of events going from past present to future but all it is is information being um, read from a disk and the time illusion is crucial it, you know it, it, it's not something that um, we, we, we need just to say oh I'm, I'm not recognizing time anymore because you know this this event started at 11 o'clock and if people didn't recognize time people would still be arriving um, and or might have come much earlier it's not that it's it's while we are following this illusion of time we realize that's what it is it's an illusion that it loses our control our control over us because when consciousness is in a state of no time then if we're trying to connect with that while being totally programmed to the illusion of time then again that is a massive way that that disconnects from that and time absolutely controls us and it's ludicrous you know you cross a line in the ocean and you go into tomorrow you cross the other way you go into yesterday I mean what's going on it's ridiculous there is only the now there is no time there is the perception of time for instance you say to people um, there's no time they go there oh there is there's a past and there's a future yeah of course there is don't be daft so okay tell me about the past well so and so happened so and so happened and then this happened that yeah okay and and where are you when you are telling me about the past where does the past exist what were you telling me about it well in the now so tell me about the future well the future where are you when you're talking about and perceiving the future you're in the now everything happens in the now everything else is illusory the way we decode it 
This is why when people have near-death experiences, often, they say there was no sequence of events, there was no time, and all these things. Why? Because they've left the body computer, which is decoding that information into the illusion of space and time. And this um, world is controlled by time. Oh, what's the time? Oh, God, is that the time? Oh, blimey. What's the time? Oh, cool, God. There's not enough time. There is plenty of time because there is no time. But there doesn't seem to be much time when we're decoding it. And it's like a, 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 a movie on a DVD. When you put a, a movie in a, in a, in a, in a, in a television uh, kind of, you know, DVD player, um, and you're watching the movie unfold, the scenes that you have watched on the movie become your perception of the past. The one you're watching now is your present, and the ones you've not yet watched are the future. And yet, the whole movie exists on one disc at the same time. And what we live in, in this reality, is a loop, what, what I call the time loop. Funnily enough, mainstream science is now talking about something called um, causal loops, which is a similar thing. I wrote a book years ago called Tales from the Time Loop, based on this. Because um, we're following a, a, a pattern around and coming back to the start. It's like a, um, it's a recurring reality. And, but the loop is the decoded world. What the loop really is, is changing vibration, which is, I'll get to in the last section today. This is really um, vital to understanding what's happening now in terms of these truth vibrations I talked about. This vibration, this base vibration um, coming out of the black holes doesn't stay constant it moves through a cycle and it moves through a cycle in the now and as it moves through this cycle of vibration or change and then comes back to the start it's triggering as it changes different information from the sun therefore we are decoding as the vibration changes different information as we do that the world appears to change because it's now got a different information base and that's what, what we're heading for. The truth vibrations are the, another change of vibration, which is going to change the world, already is. And in um, Asia, they talk about yugas, epochs, um, of cycular, what we call time, where the, you have a golden age, where there's a great expansion of consciousness, and then there's other ages, which they call dark and suppressed. Um, and what these ages are, are different ways of experiencing this reality and we can choose to come in and experience this reality or, or a golden age or whatever and we're at the epoch now where one of these yugas is being replaced by another one the mayans talk in central america become connected of course to 2012 and all that stuff that they talked about the cycle in nature of time they talk about that in africa as well do you know the zulus have a name for time and space coming from ancient times which is virtually identically the same word because they knew way back then that time and space were in effect the same thing. So what we call history and, and time is basically this cycle as we decode changing information and manifest it in here and we're in the process now of changing. So the reason so many people are now waking up to these truth vibrations is those that are, are opening because they're a different vibration to the vibration we've had before up to this point the suppressed period, um, those who are opening up to, to decode that information, they're seeing the world totally different to those who are still decoding this vibration, because we're at the point, the cusp now, where one's, they're, they're both operating together. And if you can hold consciousness in the time loop, as it were, you can understand what's happening, rather than being in this state, which is where humanity is in general, so it is changing, where well, you're going round and round and round, trying to make sense of a bewildered world, wondering what the hell it's all about. Now, like I say, the body is a biological computer. It's reading information all the time. Um, it is the vehicle through which we experience this reality for consciousness. And it's, uh, it's a bit like a spaceman on the moon. You have a, a, a space, uh, space suit and it allows you to experience a reality which you, wouldn't, you couldn't otherwise have done. And um, 
what would be crazy is if spacemen on the moon in different spacesuits of different colors made by different companies argued with each other, fought with each other, and condemned each other for having a different color or style of spacesuit. We'd say that was ludicrous, insane. Well, that's what this is, racism. Racism is judging someone by the vehicle their consciousness is experiencing, using rather, to experience this reality. That, that's why racism is not only uh, unpleasant, it's stupid, silly, ridiculous. We say, uh, who, who are you? We say, we're humans. Well, we're not. Humans is like David Icke. Humans is our experience, not who we are. It's like a software program in the body computer that gives us the experience of what we call being human. The different cultures and the different sub uh, sections of what we call humanity, they're just different types of software based on the same basic um, software. This is the, an article in the San Francisco Chronicle about DNA. And it's absolutely right. DNA is a universal software code. From bacteria to humans, the basic instructions for life are written with the same language. And that language of DNA is a, a series of codes, A, C, G, and T. A, C, G, and T um, is the basics of everything. How those four elements are placed in relationship to each other decides if we're a human, a mouse, or a virus. And when you see in the Matrix movie all these codes going up and down the screen, that's uh, very, very symbolic of, of this, uh, what I'm talking about. And the brain decodes um, that um, information into this reality. So the human body ticks all the boxes for a computer, i.e. extraordinarily sophisticated one, a holographic computer. When, when we get a virus in a computer, um, and it gets worse and worse and worse, until you can't even switch the thing on, we say, my computer's dead. And it is. But the guy who was working the computer, he's not dead, just the computer. In the same way, our computer dies through viruses of various kinds or whatever. You take the computer and you smash it on the floor or smash it against a wall, you, the computer's dead. You smash this computer against the wall hard enough, this computer's dead. But consciousness, the person working the computer isn't dead, only the computer. Then uh, we have computers going to sleep mode where they tick over on a very, very much lower level of, of electricity, life force, energy. That's what happens when we sleep and the body computer goes into sleep mode. Computers have uh, antivirus software that uh, attacks viruses that are a danger to the computer. That's what the human immune system is in a much more sophisticated way. It's constantly on the lookout for threats to the computer system. This is a picture, um, an enhanced picture, which was uh, uh, produced at the Necker Hospital in Paris, where they put tracer dye into acupuncture points on the meridian line system that acupuncture works on. And when I saw that, I thought, that's a motherboard. It's a motherboard, exactly the same principle. And what they found, interestingly, is that when this chi, photon information, is passing through this system too slowly or too quickly, the body is ill, diseased, or imbalanced in some way. And when um, we get a virus in a computer, What's the first thing we notice? Hey, my computer's slow today. What's the matter with it? Why? Because information is not passing around the computer at optimum speed. That's what that's about. And what acupuncture does, with its needles and other uh, techniques, is to ensure that the flow of chi information 
around the body computer is at optimum speed. That's what it's doing. And you get people, they say, acupuncture's stupid because you can't cure a headache by putting a pin in your toe, right? <laughs> but you can. If these meridian lines, the systems of energy information pass down through the brain, up through the toe and back up again, as they do in these, in these cycles, then if it's blocked here, it can have an effect here. <laughs> it's so simple. Um, the brain is the central processing unit of the body computer. And in a desktop computer, um, the central processing unit is a microchip. It processes information and it passes information out to the body computer, receives information back, makes decisions, send information back out again. And if that's not working properly, then you become diseased because there's an information breakdown. Uh, DNA is the hard drive of the computer, holds the, the hard drive information. And it's not just, you know, what we call physical, none of it's physical except in the decoded world illusion. But it's that DNA is also an energy field, like everything is. So what we call memory and all this stuff and the, the hard drive of, of the body is not just held in what we call as physical DNA. It's held in energy fields, what we call the auric field. Then there's the RNA, which reads the DNA. And also, um, according to people I've been talking to recently, um, is the uh, means through which the blueprint of the body, the blueprint information construct is defended from attack so that, the, so that there's not a mutation of body types. It's like it, its job, one of its jobs is to continue to restore the body to its default settings, if you like. Because um, uh, if that wasn't doing that, then we'd be mutating very, very much quicker and not necessarily in a very nice way. Um, so there's a mystery in medicine, uh, some parts of it anyway, of why when people have had donor organs like hearts or lungs or whatever, that the receiver has taken on the traits and many times the abilities they didn't have before of the donor uh, person. This man is called uh, William Sheridan. He was in a New York hospital waiting for a heart transplant. He took an art therapy course um, in uh, the run-up to that, and he was not very good. I mean, I'm a rubbish artist, me. I mean, crikey, I'm like a child. Um, you know, if I drew a train or something, I would say, oh, God, uh, 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 how old was the person who wrote, <laughs> wrote that? Must have been about three. It were me. Um, so this was Sheridan, William Sheridan, before the heart transplant. And then afterwards, he started doing things like this immediately after the art transplant, heart transplant, and he, he went back on the art therapy course. And he was bemused, and the art therapy person was bemused. But what he was doing was he, the heart is information. And he downloaded that information into the body computer system and taken things from that. Um, in other words, um, he, t he took on the aptitude to be a much better artist. Krader Mutwa, the Zulu shaman, who's nearly 90 now, a great friend of mine, he was telling me that in, 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 in the more ancient times in Africa, when they used to eat people, they had this strict law, golden rule, that if you, uh, when you boiled people, um, you had to heat them to a certain temperature. Otherwise, if you didn't, when you ate them, you became them which is kind of the same basic uh, principle. Then you have the self-identity that probably makes us identify with the body more than anything else, and that's being a man or being a woman. But you can change from a man to a woman through chemical change. So a man or a woman is not what we are, it's what we're experiencing, again. And this a story in all the newspapers in Britain a few years ago of somebody called Freaky the Chicken. And Freaky starts out as a hen. It's laying eggs. And then, for whatever reason, this apparently happens with chickens uh, in, on rare occasions, 
the, the, the body started producing massive amounts of testosterone and Freaky changed from a hen to a, a cockerel. Grew a comb, started chasing the hens and started crowing at dawn. It's gone from being a man to a, to a woman by chemical change because it's a vehicle. Consciousness is what we are. I found this on the BBC website. Scientists, uh, scientists have been able to take control of flies' brains to make females behave just like males. Researchers genetically modified the insects so that a group of brain cells that control sexual behavior could be switched on by a pulse of light. The team was able to get female fruit flies to produce a courtship song, behavior usually only seen in males. In other words, um, it's not who we are. When I, when I write books uh, in, uh, uh, during the winter time, I get up early before the sun, and when the sun comes up, the birds start to sing. Well, is there a conductor, you know, among the birds saying, hold on a second, five, four, go! No, they just do it. Why did Freaky the Chicken, after the testosterone explosion, start crowing at dawn? Did someone say, look, now you're a man, I've got to tell you something, you know? You're a cockerel now, okay? So you need to crow at dawn, all right? No, he just did it. It's a program, software program, which they follow. And then if you say to people uh, how they self-identify with the body and, and the, the human personality, they, they often say, well, it's my emotions. That's me. But our emotions. How can we actually be our emotions if, in the way that we experience them, if you can change someone's emotional personality by chemicals change and what have you? We had a lady in Britain a few years ago, again it was in all the papers, who 40 years before went spontaneously into clinical depression. For 40 years, she was in and out of institutions. They didn't know what to do with her. After 40 years, someone said to her, can you think of anything that happened about the time this started? She said, well, the only thing I can remember is that I had 19 tooth fillings with mercury. So she was advised to go on a mercury detox and have the tooth fillings removed. And she came out of clinical depression after 40 years and said, I've just, I've just found life again. And all the way through that 40 years, people, people would have said, who are you? She would have said, I'm a clinical depressive. No, she wasn't. The body computer system had been destabilized chemically and, 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 and decoded reality that way. We are also, this is a key to understanding the control system as we go through, we are receiver transmitters of information. This is what's happening as we interact with the wireless internet, the cosmic internet. We are um, uh, decoding information all the time. Now, one of the great things that is used in radio receiver transmission equipment is crystal. And it just so happens that this is a walking, talking crystal. It's what it is. The... Um, membrane of every cell, and we have trillions of them, is a liquid crystal. And together it makes a crystalline body computer. The earth is crystal, massively crystal. Every grain of sand is, an, is a crystal. Also part of the decoding system. And the DNA is a crystalline receiver transmitter of information. This is an article on DNA which talks about that. From the characteristic form of this giant molecule, a wound double helix, the DNA represents an ideal electromagnetic antenna. On one hand, it is elongated and thus a blade which can take up very well electrical pulses. On the other hand, seen from above, it has the form of a ring and thus is a very magnetical uh, antenna. So, this is the mind-body system. It is this crystalline receiver transmitter and the auric field, the energy field that it is an expression of. 
And it connects, uh, we connect from what we call the physical through into the, the energetic, the uh, non-physical, the auric field, etc., and deeper, through these vortex points, which in, in um, Hint, India and that part of the world they call chakras, what they call wide, wider the, around the world now, but this is where it started out. A S Sanskrit word meaning wheels of light. And these chakra vortexes connect into what we call the endocrine system of glands. And crucially, these two, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, which together with other um, expressions are known as the third eye. The third eye, which allows us to perceive beyond this reality. And the control system is set up to shut down that third eye, that what we call sixth sense, so that we operate only on the five senses. When you open that and you open to consciousness, you break out of these bubbles of limitation, this, these bubbles of limited perception, limited awareness. And you connect back and you're in this world, but you're not of it. That's what's happening to awakening people now. They're transforming. Now, when the third eye is closed, uh, we go into uh, and, and we are in a uh, closed down state of awareness. We operate in what I call the bubble or the eggshell, where we are operating on a tiny fraction of our multidimensional infinite consciousness and awareness. And when we're in the bubble state, this is where we are. In a bewildered world, what's going on? What's it all about? And thus, we live a false identity. And that's the key to the whole control system, getting us to self-identify with what we're not. But then people might say, but what do you mean that the world's an illusion in terms of physicality? I mean, listen to it. It's solid. Don't be stupid. And I, I grant you, it bloody looks solid. You bang your bloody head against the wall. It feels solid as well. And the world looks solid. The thing is, it can't be. Because scientists tell us it's made of atoms. And atoms have no solidity. Um, someone uh, said once uh, that if you take... Um, an atom to be a, the size of a cathedral, then the nucleus would be the size, about the size of a 10 cent piece. Um, and most of what we call the atom, which makes up the solid world, is what we call empty space. There is no such thing as empty space, but you get what I mean. What is happening and why you've got this apparent paradox between Atoms that are, have no solidity, making a solid world, it's all part of the decoding process. From the metaphysical universe, the vibrational information construct, through the electrical, through the digital, into the holographic. And it's the decoding process that gives us the illusion of physicality, not the fact that it's actually really physical. It's the same principle as taking information off the disk and decoding it onto the screen. This is our screen. This is what's happening all the time. And in the decoding process, if the information is encoded for us to read it like that, we will read this as solid. And when you go into other states of awareness, you can go beyond that. I had a, a did I say a friend, an acquaintance near, near my home many years ago, and she, she, she used to have this room, she had this big house, and she used to have this, this room where she let people come and meditate for long periods of time like days and weeks sometimes, and they would go in there. And this one person, she said, was in there so long, and there was nothing, no sound, nothing. And one day, being English, she said, I thought I'd take him a cup of tea, right? So she tiptoes up, and she opens the door and dropped the tea. Because she said, what I saw was the top half of his body here to his head, I could see the bottom half of his body, nothing there. Because he's gone in such a deep state of awareness, a different state of consciousness, that he's gone beyond the physical, and therefore he stopped decoding it, or part of it. The reason it looks physical, but it's not, and it looks three-dimensional, but it's not, is because it's a hologram, a holographic world we live in here. For people who haven't come across holograms, they are created, the ones you buy in the shops and stuff, 
They're created by um, a laser, part of which is deflected onto a photographic print, and part of which is deflected to, um, across the object and back onto the uh, photographic print, where it collides with that part of the, um, the laser. So what it creates on the print is what we call, or what they call, an interference pattern, a wave interference pattern. And it's the same principle as dropping two pebbles in a pond, and as the disturbance creates waves and they collide with each other, that pattern is a waveform representation of where the pebbles fell, how heavy they were, how fast they fell, etc., etc. It's the same with, with, with holograms. This is a holographic print. Now, it reminds you of a fingerprint, it does me, and I think that's very, very um, significant too. But what is it? It's waveform. It's information in waveform. And in there is all the information about the object that's been photographed. Then they fire another laser at that waveform and suddenly, apparently, the best of them anyway, apparently solid three-dimensional forms appear. And like I say, uh, the, the best of them can look as solid as you and me, especially the, the, the ones they're making now. It's all, these are all holograms that you're looking at. There you are, Mom. There you go. <laughs> I'm not getting a knighthood, you know. That you're, no, I'm not getting a knighthood. I think it's when I said the Queen was a Satanist that I, I lost all chance of a knighthood. <laughs> these are all holograms. Now, this man is a hologram um, that's projected onto a stage in Adelaide, Australia, when this guy is standing in Melbourne, Australia. CNN have done things with projections of reporters into a studio when they're somewhere else. They look three-dimensional. The, uh, the, the best ones, however, um, that they're doing now look as solid as you and me. So we're, we're decoding waveform into this just as with a holographic uh, situation, the laser is reading this information and turning it into three-dimensional form. And um, it's a construct we're living in. Interestingly, in, um, I've been writing about the fact that this is a holographic reality for years and years and years. And in, um, I think it was January 2009, something like that, I'm passing through Heathrow Airport. And this is um, a mainstream, absolute mainstream scientific magazine and the front page was, you are a hologram projected from the edge of the universe. Um, which is what some scientists have um, concluded. Well, they're right. And then we have this um, paradox that bewilders scientists also. Which is, they have seen in the, in the deep study of quantum physics, that a particle takes a waveform at the same time. That something can be a particle and a wave at the same time. They're going, how can that happen? It is so simple. When you create, making holograms, the photographic print, the waveform information, and you fire the laser at that information and it reads it into this three-dimensional form, when it becomes the hologram, the waveform information doesn't disappear. It's there at the same time the hologram is, because it's being read from the waveform to that. If that disappears, so does that. The two have to appear together. That's the particle, the hologram. That's the waveform, the information from which the hologram comes. Another amazing thing about holograms. Every part of a hologram is a smaller part of the whole. When you cut a, a holographic print, a piece like that off, you don't get that section of this picture, you get that size version of the whole picture. Every time. And that is why this is possible. That's why reflexology can find part, uh, points on the feet and the hands and different parts of the body that relate to different organs because it's a hologram it has to be like that 
This is why acupuncture can find points on the ear that relate to all the different parts of the body. It's a hologram. It has to be like that. So people, when, when people, like in mainstream science, dismiss this stuff, it's impossible. No, it's impossible from your perspective of reality, mate. It's not actually impossible. And that's what this is. Oh, your palm reading, palm reading, that's just mumbo jumbo rubbish. <laughs> there are palm readers, there are psychics, there are um, reflexologists who are absolute rubbish. It's not what they're doing, it's how well they're doing it. But the principle of palm reading absolutely fits the hologram. Because the hand is a representation of the body. And if you can read the, what, what, what that, where that information is encoded in the hand, you can uh, make uh, statements about the body. And the, the person's mental and emotional and projected state. I've looked through a um, microscope in a, a man's uh, doctor's, uh, a physician man's um, uh, studio clinic in uh, California called Harvey Biggleton, and I've seen holographic blood. Um, with images in it that he read to say, he said to me, he said to me, um, he looked, he put, he put a bit of my blood on a thing and looked through it. He said, you having problems with your hips? I said, bloody right I am. He said, um, oh, I can see. And I looked through and there, there, there were, in the blood was a holographic three-dimensional pair of hips. I mean, the world's so different to what we think it is. And then he, um, increased and increased the, the, the power of the ma magnification. He said, look through this. I looked through. My blood was quartz crystal, if you go deep enough into it. And so this whole idea you hear over and over again, as above, so below, that's exactly right. Why? Because it's a hologram. As, as below, as above, as be above, so below. It has to be like that. So... We live in this, uh, this, this, this hologram, but it's part of a greater hologram and a greater hologram until you've got what I call the super hologram, which is the universe. And this is, again, let me just go back here. This is why, for instance, this is the human energy field and this is the planet's energy field. Again, different levels of the hologram. And then on another level of decoding through to the holographic, um, we create a, a digital level. This is why numbers and numerology and stuff works and why numbers keep coming up in sequences. Um, the brain decodes at one point into um, digital. And what they're doing now, and this really brings us forward to this reality, is they're creating digital holograms, which are a major step forward to the way I've just described. And this is, was a, an article about uh, this and it said of these digital holograms and they look so real so real that when Ford used a uh, digital hologram to show off a car concept model people stopped afraid to walk into it they thought the holographic car was really there and one level of, of our brain works on the binary system of on-off electrical charges. What's something else that works on the on-off electrical charges? One of these things. And the brain also does trinary, where there's another number introduced, and that's what they're developing now in some of the most advanced computer uh, operations, trinary-based um, computers. And that relates to these codes as well, the DNA codes. And of course, the portrayal in the Matrix movie that at one level that reality was digital. It is. It is. And then the question comes why haven't scientists seen this? Why haven't they discovered this? Well, some have actually. Um, but the major reason that science in general hasn't is because of one of them. When you look at science, it's a mass of disciplines, um, specializations, 
and they fight for funding, they often fight for prominence, therefore they don't talk to each other and share information, and therefore they don't get it. And also, the control system controls science through funding because it doesn't want people to connect the dots and come to see the bloody obvious. And when I had that ayahuasca experience and that voice talked to me about the nature of reality for five hours, I didn't just accept it. I came back and I, I looked and checked it out with what science has discovered. And I found that if you take that bit and 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 you put them together, they've already done it. They've already know it's an illusion. But they don't do that. And so they say, you're mad, you are. You're crazy. When you look through the world like that, or at the world like that, which is what most science does, although some on the cutting edge of quantum physics are, are different, but when, when you look at the world like that, how are you going to understand the world? I watched, I watched a television program on British television a few months ago, and it was an hour, it was an hour, asking the question, what is the biggest number? It went on and on and on. Uh, they went to a child. A child said, the biggest number is 10, right? And then they went on and on until this scientist um, reeled off this number that went on for, not ever, but for a long, long time. A an hour. What's the biggest number? There is no biggest number except that. Infinity. Infinity is the biggest number. Because everything is infinite. And it, lest we need reminding, infinity, it goes on forever. The fact that you're, they're trying to find that what, what the biggest number is means they're still seeing limitation. What numbers are, are digital expressions of vibrational states. And this is why the, the, the secret societies at the inner core level who understand this, not most of the people in secret societies, the inner core level, they keep using the same numbers, and you see number sequences uh, um, coming up all the time. You find that ancient uh, buildings at a time when they, this, this information was what more widely known were built um, using certain dimensions that relate to certain number systems, like pi, golden mean, they call them. It's because they understood that numbers are um, expressions of vibration, and the vibration affects the building and what goes on in there. So what does all this mean? Okay, let's finish this section with this. What it means is humans are living a false identity from the moment they enter this world to the moment they leave it. We perceive ourselves to be humans when that's our experience. We are consciousness having the experience. We are multidimensional beings. We have endless levels of awareness that are there to be tapped into and connected with. We are not just the body, we are energy, consciousness, awareness. And people who have had near-death experiences, um, and I've read widely about this over the years, the common themes are amazing of what they experience. Um, where they leave the body, uh, and they often talk about going through a tunnel and all the rest of it, but this is what one person described in his near-death experience when he left the body and it's, it's fantastic what he said he said everything from the beginning my birth my ancestors my children my wife everything comes together simultaneously I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me I saw everything they were thinking now what they thought then what was happening before what was happening now there is no time there is no sequence of events no such thing as limitation of distance of period of time of place I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously that is who we really are and people go well I'm frightened of dying frightened of becoming that again terrified it's the lens, the body, that gives us the illusion that we're who we have been led to believe we are. And this is a key area to how it's done. How the illusion is maintained, how the sense of limitation is maintained. The brain has two hemispheres, the right brain and the left brain, and it, there's a bridge between the two called the corpus callosum. 
And when you are in a whole brain state, you have both sides of the brain speaking to each other and sharing information through that. That's not what the control system wants. The two hemispheres of the brain have very, very different ways of decoding reality. This is mainstream science I'm talking here now. The left brain decodes reality as a sequence. You see, when I say there's no time, it's understandable when people say, yeah, but there was, a, yes, there's a sequence of events. There's got to be time. No. There's got to be a way of decoding reality to appear to be a sequence. So in the now, uh, the left side of the brain, it decodes and arranges information in a sequence. So we appear to be moving through what we call linear time. And it looks at the world in parts. The left brain decodes structure, it decodes distance, time, it decodes language, uh, and it's looking, it sees everything as a part from everything else. The right side of the brain is where we get intuition from, we get it from the heart too, but intuition there. It's holistic as they say, it looks at everything as wholes. It, it, it is a simultaneous processor, whereas the left brain is a parallel processor. Now, if the two are speaking to each other, then you get the best of both worlds. If they're not, then we get trapped in the illusion of this reality. And this is how they do it. This is uh, Neil Haig's depiction of what the left brain does, structure and all the rest of it. The right brain is where we get creativity from. It's where we connect to wider consciousness. It's where we get intuition, insight from. It's where the artist comes from, the great musician comes from. And the reason that composers could compose music um, while they were deaf, how did they do that? It's because they were taking it, they were decoding it at a vibrational level um, in another form without it actually passing through the ears. Because what is music? It's vibration. I mean, it's obvious. Now, this corpus colossum, this should be the bridge where these two uh, exchange information. What they've done with our society and at the, the core of the control system, cold, calculatedly done, is they've locked us in the left side of the brain, which only sees reality in very limited terms. What they've done is put soldiers on the door to the left brain to stop right brain perception getting in there and giving it another insight on life. We call these soldiers the education system, the mainstream media, medicine, science. Get in there, shut up. And through these methods, media, religion, education, de 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 uh, destabilizing the body and the brain through chemical uh, in food and drink. The idea is to um, stop us decoding reality in as expanded way and get stuck in here. And then you think about this. You're born and you go to school at a very early age now. And then you go through school, and you go through college and university. Lots of people do anyway. What's happening in that period? From very, very early age, right up into the teenage years. The system is saying, take this information, left brain information, hold it there, and then when, when, I, when I say pick up your exam paper and, and, and you have two hours to complete it, I want all that information, any much you can remember, back out on the exam paper, out of the left brain. And if you do that well, you pass exams and you get rewarded for being a prisoner of the left brain. You then decide on your specialization. You might want to go into science or, or medicine or whatever, even politics. And, and then you go into your science and you go into your medicine and you have to pass more exams where the system tells you what to believe about science and what to believe about medicine and what to believe about the body. And then you regurgitate that out from the left brain onto an exam paper. Oh, well done. You're a doctor. You're a scientist. 
And then, if you progress even through that, you become one of the people who administrates the whole structure of medicine, and the whole structure of science in a country. And what are you by the time you get there? Boom, boom, boom. A complete prisoner of the left brain. And then someone else coming through, who, uh, uh, like a child who, who, who has, has got his right brain open, and he might look at the same information that's going in here, and he might say, please, miss, it, it, it's rubbish. And, and what do they do? Um, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, um, there's a problem with Johnny. Uh, uh, what's the problem? Um, he's asking questions. We, we fear that if he does it, they'll all want to do it. In other words, when you were a right brain, you get marginalized in this left brain system. And that's why we live in a left brain society. Now this lady, Jill Bolte Taylor, is a brain scientist, neuroanatomist they call them. And in 1996, she had an experience which encapsulates what I'm talking about in this first section, because we're nearly finished now. And it's this. She got up one day, she wasn't feeling very well, and she thought, well, I'll, I'll get on the exercise machine and uh, see if I can work through it. She said, I got on the, on the exercise machine and um, I looked down at my um, hands and they weren't my hands anymore. And then I realized there was no part of me that was me because I merged into everything else. There was just one energy field. Although she was still individual in her own way because that's the point of attention. She um, then realized that she was having a stroke in the left side of the brain. And she went, she said, during this period into a place of absolute bliss, what she called La La Land, where she was everything and everything was her, and there was just this incredible feeling of love and peace. And every now and again, she said, the left brain would kick in and go, you've got to, you've got to get help, you've got to get help. And this is why the left brain is not a bad thing. It's a bad thing when it becomes the governor of our reality. And she said, what I did, she said, I, I got hold of these uh, business cards because I couldn't remember the number to ring work and ask for help. So I, I had to look through these business cards. And she said, as I was looking through them, I didn't see numbers or uh, words. I saw squiggles. And this was what she said. They look to me like pixels. What's happening is her, her brain's not decoding reality as it normally would, and she's gone, she's gone back one stage into the digital level of the decoding system. She said, I, I took um, 45 minutes to find, these, uh, to, to find the squiggles uh, that I needed, and she said, I then tried to phone work. And eventually, she managed it, and someone picked the phone up the other end and they must have said hello so and so so and so she said all i heard on the other end was this sound when he picked the phone up going woof 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 and she said i said to him i said to him I, this is what i said i said it's jill i'm in trouble and all i heard was woof 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 because the left side of the brain is no longer decoding sound waves properly, therefore producing words that we recognize. Anyway, she, um, oh, another thing she said, while she's in this state, she said, I let, I, I was released from 37 years of emotional baggage because she'd been released from the body decoding that rubbish. And, um, she survived, thankfully, and, uh, if you go on the internet um, and you put Jill Bolte Taylor in, there's a, like a 25 minute video in which she explains in detail what happened to her. It's fascinating. So we are in such a low level of our true possibility because of the way this manipulation works. This is a man called Stephen Wiltshire. He's an English guy and he's what they call an autistic savant. And some of these uh, people that apparently have these sort of flaws in their brain system actually manifest staggering gifts because they're decoding reality in a way that's much closer to our true potential. 
This man, a boy then, was flown over London for half an hour in a helicopter. No paper, no pencils, nothing. He just had to look out the window. He came back and he drew accurately London from the air. Even getting the number of windows correct. You go onto his website, stilvanwiltshire.com or something like that, you will, uh, you will see some of the other stuff he did. He did the same in Rome. This man is an autistic savant called Daniel Tammet. And he has become famous for learning languages like that. So much so that he went onto Icelandic television and was challenged to come back a week later fluent in Icelandic. Well, you can see what bloody Icelandic's like. He came back seven days later, fluent in Icelandic. And his Icelandic language teacher said, this man is not human. But he was missing the point. This man is how humans are meant to be. Because he's accessing parts of the brain that we're not accessing. The level of genius, the level of potential that we have here locked away that's being denied us systematically is absolutely staggering and much of it is due to um, being locked in the left brain and all these things that are put in front of us to scramble our brains, scramble our emotions, divert our focus and keep us in the box. Keep us in mind frozen mind rather than free-flowing infinite consciousness where you can learn Icelandic in a week. Keep us in the, in the, uh, the treadmill. And interestingly, one of the things that this reality, this, this society worships is the intellect. Oh, he's got a great intellect. Well, intellect's okay as long as it's a servant of consciousness and not the governor and suppressor of con consciousness, which is what most intellect is. This is the isolated intellect. That's why I, I keep putting this thing up for the media, for science, um, for medicine, is because all those things are dominated by the isolated intellect. Therefore must be limited. As this man said, uh, Albert Camus, an intellectual is someone whose mind watches itself. And if consciousness is not watching mind, you have a world that we live in now. That's what the isolated intellect does for us. And we have this fork in the road, I said at the start, consciousness or mind, all that is or little me, right brain or left brain, or a balance of the two. So it's not even, if you get round to the detail, free your mind, it's free ourselves from mind and let consciousness in so that mind serves consciousness instead of being the governor of it. And one of the great ways to do this, I find, is to look at life again with a blank sheet of paper. Because just as the hypnotist in the stage show is impregnating a belief system you are eating an apple when it's a potato. So preconceived idea, what we call belief, is having the same effect. Our preconceived ideas and beliefs are imposing themselves on the way we are decoding reality.